I'm looking forward to following up here with the first two uh, presenters and sort of bringing in um, just a kind of a some practical extension uh, perspectives to this. Um, I also want to thank uh, my original co-author and co-presenter of the first version of this presentation, um, safely utilizing animal manures and compost on small produce farms and its perspective um, here for Montana. So, you know, Montana is known as cattle country. We're primarily a cow calf state, but we do have some um, beef backgrounding and finishing, some dairies and some hog CAFOs. So we do have animal production systems where manure uh, is collected. Um, but all counties in our state do have sufficient conventional crop ground relative to manure nutrients uh, to, to agronomically utilize those resources. Um, while we may have some high areas of nutrient concentration within a county or within a region of the state, this can easily be remedied uh, with nearby export of those manure nutrients. So where are they going? Well, the top bullet points here are all the common places that you know, many of us have worked with uh, management planning and nutrient management planning and whatnot. So just moving manure and manure products to conventional crop and forage ground. Um, a lot of our nutrients from manure in the state uh, get processed to compost and go to reclamation projects. Uh, so, you know, usually some sort of mining reclamation project. Uh, it could go to organic row and or forage crops. Turf and green industries, you know, your sod farms and nurseries and whatnot uh, utilize a, a fair amount of our exported or manure nutrients exported from the, the site of origin. And then finally, sort of the new and emerging opportunity um, driven by, you know, interest in local food systems uh, across the country, but in our Montana communities as well, that opens the opportunity to move uh, manure to small produce farms and market gardens. Um, and this, some images here sort of demonstrate the, uh, the use of those um, manure-based uh, products. And this is at our student run um, organic farm, which is actually also a retail farm. But in this image, we see the importance of bringing uh, manure in, manure based compost to renovate soils, uh, and then also provide for ongoing fertility. Um, so this compost here was um, mostly beef manure from a research scale, but conventional beef uh, feeding facility. Uh, and it's being incorporated into soil under this movable high tunnel. Um, and a quick comment, these high tunnels are really important to us for vegetable production in Montana. Uh, you see this one day here where they're working in the area. And then the image on the right, um, we see snow piled up from a late spring snowstorm. So uh, these high tunnels make small, veg small scale vegetable production uh, possible in Montana. Uh, we have noticed um, social barriers related to the exchange of nutrients from the animal ag industry to market gardens. Um, and that represents, you know, missed market opportunities for um, moving manure nutrients into another sector or help, helping better balance local um, nutrient balance uh, and such. And we're hoping to solve this just through more facilitation and education, both by uh, extension and government agencies. And a lot of the concern or these social barriers, you know, it's just based around, well, the important concern over food safety, um, perhaps concern over herbicide residues passing through the manure and the compost, and then concerns over implications for organic certification. And real quick, I wanna point out um, a case study about a, a pretty interesting unconventional farm. Uh, Amalthea Organic Dairy primarily raises dairy goats and then they have their own uh, cheese plant. But in all of their um, waste management cycles and whatnot, uh, they also have other enterprises. They have some pastured pork and they have an organic vegetable enterprise. Um, so they manufacture uh, compost, and it's mostly used for their on-site animal feed crops, and that's a bunch of organically certified uh, crop feed crop ground. Uh, they also use the, the compost back into their organic vegetable enterprise, 
And then they also um, sometimes engage in occasional compost sales. Um, but they are moving these nutrients through multiple enterprises on their farm. Uh, everything is certified organic in this case. Um, and then the image shows some of their uh, compost working areas. Um, so the most raw stuff here is in the foreground in these uh, bigger windrows. Um, there's some uh, curing piles and windrows back here, a finishing screen. And then there's another storage area, not in that image, uh, where the finished compost is um, stored separate from all of the uh, raw and manure and compost working areas. Um, we've mentioned already the previous two speakers brought forth uh, FISMA and uh, don't need to speak too much about it now, or again, I should say, but uh, just to remind everybody that it does focus on uh, prevention of food safety issues. And though the rules are supposed to be science and risk-based, uh, as we've heard just recently, we recognize that additional research um, can provide further guidance and understanding of the risks involved. Uh, and then potential policy adaptations. So on the practical advice side, uh, this is what Andrea, uh, my colleague at Montana Department of Agriculture in the Produce Safety Program, she likes to call it her musts and shoulds lists. All right, and this is really pulled from the different rules and recommendations, but um, an operation, a produce operation um, under FISMA, must, know, must store and convey manure and compost so that they do not impact or interact with uh, the produce covered by the rule, food contact surfaces and uh, processing areas, areas uh, used for any other uh, FISMA or produce safety rule covered activities, um, should not interfere with or interact with water sources and water distribution systems. Um, you know, we heard earlier how um, irrigation water uh, can be a potential conduit for pathogens from manure to produce. And then any other soil amendments, you don't want the, the raw manure or unfinished compost products to uh, interact with or possibly contaminate other soil amendments. Should practices, this is getting down into a little more details about how you might accomplish those musts. So you should keep raw manure and finished compost in separate areas. Uh, like I explained previously with the Amalthea dairy example, uh, they have three different compost and soil amendment working and storage areas. So you have that, that gap and that distance. Um, you should designate specific equipment and tools for dealing with soil amendments and uh, you know, raw versus treated amendments. And then when you must have or need to have shared equipment, uh, then you should have a cleaning and sanitation program uh, when that equipment moves from uh, dealing with a raw type soil amendment to another purpose on the farm, particularly anything that would be uh, closer contact with the actual produce. <clears throat> More should steps uh, to prevent this cross-contamination at the you know, small farm level or any farm really. Limit access and traffic around all the soil amendment areas. Uh, that includes humans, farm animals, nuisance animals and scavengers, um, equipment, any, any sort of traffic or movement around the farm. You wanna be storing uh, these, place, these materials in such a way that uh, regular traffic is not going to cause cross-contamination. Um, and then just like we would manage uh, manure and compost storage on any size operation, uh, you want to use best management practices um, for pollution prevention around these storage areas as well. So appropriate stormwater management, runoff or leachate capture and management if necessary. And these would all be, uh, you know, best management practices appropriate to the climate, environment, and other um, state and local rules. Um, USDA good agricultural practice standards also overlap um, along with these uh, woulds or shoulds, shoulds and musts uh, that we talked about from FISMA. And some of this is very similar once again. So looking at treated over non-treated um, uh, soil amendments uh, of manure origin, 
uh, the right application timing and considering the extending those harvest intervals that were discussed, the 9120, uh, the application method, handling and storage. We spoke about that just two slides ago in more detail. And then record keeping about the management of manure, compost, composting processes, and uh, all of the so uh, soil amendments used. As far as organic uh, certification, uh, there's some other you know, best practices or due diligence. We've already discussed 9120 uh, with um, crops contacting the ground and, and crops that may be above the ground, uh, but also the issue uh, that we've dealt with a lot here in Montana as manures from animal agriculture have moved into the small produce sector um, is the issue of ag chemical residues in that manure compost. And so this is just going to come down to uh, producer due diligence to make sure uh, that those types of residues are not going to impact their production. Um, and then as always, when we're talking about an organically certified operation, um, you know, you should work with an expert certifier um, as you communicate with farmers um, and make sure anything they're doing or adding is um, okay on the NOP list of approved products. So there are a variety of players here in Montana that are working with producers um, with the produce safety rule in the national organic program that's really led in the state by Montana Department of Agriculture. We have a state certification program. There are other organic certifiers in the state, um, but they play a large role in assisting producers in maintaining their certifications while using uh, the types of products we're um, learning about today. As far as regulatory education, that also happens from our Montana Department of Agriculture, as well as extension, both in agriculture and in foods and nutrition. And then trade organizations as well are um, important conduits for education on this topic to our growers. And then as far as um, just good agricultural practices and um, all around best management practices, a lot of the same folks are involved there, but also some of our producer co-ops are involved in um, educating producers and in helping manage all of this for um, growers that may be a member of, say, this example uh, co-op. So in summary, uh, manure and compost are valuable nutrient inputs for small produce farms. Uh, they are not generally prohibited, um, but we rely on best practices and rules to reduce the risk of uh, some sort of contamination and a foodborne illness. Um, and that just comes down to a proper management as discussed today. And in general, everything we talked about here, the best practices and um, you know these rules, it focuses on preventive measures over widespread sampling and testing of the food products. So this is an upfront preventive management, um, you know, set of recommendations and programs that we've discussed here today, um, instead of, you know, actual widespread sampling and testing of all the produce produced. <clears throat> 